Good day, I'm Brian Hoplin, President of Research to Prevent Blindness. I'd like to welcome you to RPB's Lunch and Learn, Eye on Low Vision. Research to Prevent Blindness is the leading nonprofit organization supporting eye research directed at the prevention, treatment, or eradication of all diseases that damage and destroy sight. <clears throat> RPB was founded in 1960 and over our 60 year history, we have awarded more than $383 million in research grants to the most talented vision scientists at the nation's leading medical schools. As a result, RPB has been associated with nearly every major breakthrough in the understanding and treatment of vision science, a vision loss rather. In today's educational session, our third Lunch and Learn event, we will hear from two RPB supported talented scientists about low vision causes, management, and assistive technologies. One of our speakers, Dr. Myung Kwan, received an RPB Lions Club's International Foundation Low Vision Research Award, which supports the investigation of the causes of low vision, as well as um, new avenues for diagnosis and treatment. And one of our speakers, speakers Dr. Gong Lo, received an RPB Reader's Digest Partners for Sight Foundation Innovation in Technology Low Vision Research Award, which supports the development of assistive technologies for persons with low vision. I wanna say thank you to all of the generous supporters of RPB who make our work possible. The importance of supporting medical research has never been so apparent. We thank you for your partnership in supporting innovative vision research to ensure that new breakthroughs are possible. But uh, if you have not yet supported RPB, please consider doing so to help make sure that we are able to continue these breakthroughs. But getting back to today's session, let me introduce our moderator. Dimitri Azar, MD, MBA, is the Chief Executive Officer for 2020 Therapeutics which focuses on the convergence of AI or artificial intelligence, microelectronics and scalable digital technologies to treat eye diseases. And it is a joint venture between Verily Life Sciences and Alphabet sponsored by Google and Santon Pharmaceutical Company. Dr. Azar is also distinguished professor and BA field chair of ophthalmic research at the University of Illinois College of Medicine where he formerly was Dean of Medicine. Dr. Azar is an ophthalmic surgeon who has made significant contributions to the pathogenesis and treatment of corneal diseases and to pioneering advances in refractive surgery. He has served as a key advisor on Verily Ophthalmic Projects since 2014. Dr. Azar will introduce our two speakers for today and moderate the Q&A session at the end. Each speaker will speak for 20 minutes and I will serve as timekeeper. I will give each a warning when they have reached the 18 minute mark and they have two minutes to wrap up. We wanna make sure that we have sufficient time at the end for a robust Q&A component to this session. But with that, Dr. Azar, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, for uh asking me to moderate this session. It's a real honor and a pleasure for me uh, to join you and join uh, this RPB Lunch and Learn uh, session. Uh, this is uh, very, very exciting, especially that the topic is uh, low vision. And uh, uh, during your introduction, very kind introduction, you mentioned this convergence between technology and ophthalmology and uh, clinical eye care. Uh, in the area of low vision, this has become a, an even greater uh, area of focus where there is overlap uh, that uh, today we will be seeing a lot of the applications uh, towards the overlap between psychology, between neuroscience, uh, clinical care, and technology. Uh, and I'm uh, honored to introduce our two speakers today and uh, moderate the uh, questions at the end. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Remy Young Kwan. She is currently an assistant professor 
of the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University. She obtained her PhD in Cognitive Biological Psychology and Statistics at the University of Minnesota in 2010. After graduation, she joined the Computational and Functional Vision Lab at the University of Southern California as a postdoctoral research associate, and then completed another two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Scapin's Eye Research Institute, which parenthetically is a place where I was a professor when I was uh, and a senior scientist when I was in Boston uh, and, and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kwan then served on the faculty of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Alabama at Birmingham from 2014 to 2020. Her research focuses, uh, as you will hear uh, today, on visual perception in low vision, brain plasticity following visual impairments, and low vision rehabilitation. Her work is primarily concerned with understanding how eye disorders and abnormal visual experience affect the way visual information is processed in the visual pathways. Her research has been funded by Research to Prevent Blindness, the National Eye Institute with an R01 award, and the Eyesight Foundation of Alabama. She currently serves on NIH Scientific Review Committee and the Vision Science Society Abstract Review Committee. Mi Young, please uh, proceed. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dimitri, for the nice introduction. And first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the RPB and Lions Club International Foundation for their generous support for my research. And I also like to give a special thanks to Brian and Diana for giving me this great opportunity. And today I'd like to share with you guys with the, the work from my lab addressing the, some of the important issues in low vision. So being able to see and recognize the world around us require the transmission of visual sensory information from the retina to the cortex. And however, aging and or eye disease often brings about substantial changes to the optical or retinal or cortical property of the human visual system. And so these changes tend to uh, degrade visual information along the following dimension that includes spatial resolution, uh, image contrast and field of view. So thus it's very important for us to understand the perceptual and functional consequences of visual impairment for early detection and management of visual disorder and also rehabilitation for the remaining vision. So our lab is particularly interested in identifying the factor limiting daily visual activities such as reading or object recognition in people with low vision and also understanding perceptual cortical changes following visual impairment and also developing rehabilitative strategies that may optimize the remaining vision of people with low vision. So low vision is defined as visual acuity of 2070 or worse or a visual field of less than 20 degree in better eyes with best, best possible correction. Or you can think of any chronic visual impairments not correctable by lenses or other standard treatment that affect uh, everyday visual function. So major eye disease that uh, cause low vision in the United States include age-related macular degeneration or AMD uh, and glaucoma. On the other hand, globally, cataract is still one of the major causes of low vision. So approximately 6.5 million Americans over the age of 65 have severe visual impairments and the aging society is expecting to increase this number. So then what are the perceptual issues associated with low vision? And blur is uh, one of the major perceptual issues associated with low, uh, low vision as shown in these images. So it could significantly reduce the visual acuities, that is the ability to discern the fine detail information with precision. So those with poor visual acuity would experience difficulty recognizing small letter. On second, contrast sensitivity, that is the ability to distinguish a target from its background is also significantly impaired in low vision. And thus, as is illustrated in these images, and those with reduced contrast sensitivity likely experience difficulty recognizing faint letters or object. So reduced visual field is another perceptual issues in low visions. So the dark area in this visual field map indicate low so visual sensitivity. So as you can see, the patterns of sensitive, the severity of the visual field loss comes in various forms. For example, central vision loss is quite common in uh, age-related macular degenerations due to retinal degeneration in macular region. 
So that is the central part of the retina. The picture on the right is a popular image illustrating the view from AMD patient. However, unlike this illustration, clinical research showed that majority of AMD patients are not aware of their scotoma or visual field defect. And even if they are, they notice that uh, things disappear and reappear rather than seeing an obscure or dark visual field. And similar perceptual phenomena occurs in glaucoma, which is known to have a gradual perceptual uh, peripheral vision loss due to ganglion cell damage. So it is often illustrated as the image on the right. So like AMD patients, the majority of glaucoma patients are not aware of their visual field defect. And as shown in these stud studies, none of them perceive the black tunnels or uh, a dark part in their visual field. So therefore, these representations of visual field loss may mislead patients about their vision loss, thereby impeding uh, early detection and treatment of blinding eye disease or further delay effective management of uh, visual, visual impairment. So to address these very issues, our lab is currently working on applying a scotoma awareness uh, training to patients with bilateral visual field defects. So goal of our tra visual training is to help patients to be aware of the exact location and extent of their scotoma by overlaying the area of the visual field defect with visible scotoma using a gaze contingent display. So during the training, patients perform a highly demanding visual search task in the presence of visual scotoma as shown in here. So we expect that this awareness training may help patients optimize uh, their eye movement or scanning strategy as they perform everyday visual function. So now I'd like to talk about the, the functional issues associated with low vision. So among many, as shown in here, reading or driving or walking are the known to be the major difficulty reported by patients with low vision. And although visual acuity is the most common measure of visual function, it is known to be a, a poor indicator of patients' everyday activity, even including readings. So for example, despite relatively normal visual acuities around 2020 and intake central visual field, reading difficulty are quite common even in relatively moderate stage of glaucoma. So you might wonder, so what may explain this apparent discrepancy? And we found that it has to do with the glaucomatous macular damage that may not be readily captured by the standard visual test, such as parametry that is a visual field map or visual acuities. And according to recent imaging studies, macular dam damage is quite common in early stage of glaucoma. For example, significant loss of ganglion cell is present in the macular region of glaucomatous eyes. And this uh, retina ganglion cell or RGC are the output neuron of the retina as shown in, in this slide. And, and they are associated with perceptual phenomena called visual crowding. Then what are the visual uh, crowding? So for those who are not familiar with visual crowding, I want you to fixate at the red cross in the uh, middle of the slide and try to recognize the single letter on the right. I'm pretty sure most of you probably have no trouble recognizing this, this isolated letter. Now try to recognize the middle letter on the left while fixing on the cross. I'm pretty sure it will be very difficult, right? Almost impossible to recognize the middle letters unless you cheat, right? So, um, so this phenomena is called crowding. So it is due to the nearby items interfering the recognition of targets. So as you have no trouble recognizing the same letters when it is presented alone, so crowding cannot be simply explained by reduced visual acuity or contrast sensitivity for a given retina location. So crowding is common in everyday visual tasks such as face recognition, reading, or visual search as shown in this slide. And it is more pronounced in peripheral vision, but also occurs in central vision for some clinical populations such as uh, dyslexia or amblyopia. So interestingly, we observed significantly increased crowding in central visual field of glaucomatous eyes and this increased crowding in turns appeared to be reduced the visual spans. 
that is the number of letters you can recognize at one glance. So this visual span is known to be highly correlated with the reading speed. So if you have a short visual span, it is likely to slow down your reading speed. So we found that there is a significant shrinkage of the visual span, even in moderate glaucoma. On average, they tend to recognize uh, more than two letters less than what is expected from age-matched normal control. So importantly, we found that um, the visual span was the best predictor for the reading speed of glaucoma patient, but neither visual acuity nor contrast sensitivity was. This was also true for driving. So our study on older drivers showed that at fault motor vehicle collision environment was significantly associated with impairment in driving visual, the visual field, particularly left visual field impairment, but not with the visual acuity or nor contrast sensitivity. So this study together show a critical gap between clinical measurement and everyday visual function. So as we all know, so various structural and functional assessments are routinely performed in an eye clinic. However, these measurements often do not uh, directly speak for patients' everyday visual functions. So as a result, eye care specialists or patients often do not have a clear understanding of how, for example, visual acuity of, of 20 hundred or a particular level of retina damage corresponds to a patient's visual performance, such as reading or face recognition or object recognition or driving. So this existing gap may impose difficulty for clinician in making appropriate referrals for rehabilitation services and also providing a recommendation regarding occupational disability or driving. So to fill this gap, our lab is currently taking advantage of data mining and machine learning approach to utilize these various measurements in evaluating the functional impact of visual impairment. So ultimately, we hope to develop a metric system that can translate a patient's collective eye health information into everyday visual functions. So we believe that this system may help clinician gauge a patient's ability to carry out major visual activity given their eye health condition. So although we have a long way to go, we are very encouraged by some of the promising results. So as a first step, we quantify how much the retina structural data are related to some of the functional measurements, such as visual acuity or contrast sensitivity. So as shown in here, so we use a deep neural network that is a machine learning algorithm inspired by the structure and function of the human brain. So like the human brain, it can be trained to perform a particular visual task, such as object recognition or a face recognition. And this method has been uh, used in various medical applications to identify biomarker for pathological disorders. However, here we train the network to predict the patient's visual acuity or contrast sensitivity solely based on their uh, retina structural data measured by an imaging technique called optical coherence tomography, OCT. So as shown in here, we found that patients' visual acuity can be reliably predicted from their retina structural data alone. Here, uh, here on the right side of the slide, we visualize a critical retina feature used by the network for the acuity prediction. So interestingly, we found that the photoreceptor layers where photosensitive neurons are located was the most critical feature for predicting visual acuity. The same goes with contrast sensitivity. However, as shown on the bottom right side, uh, bottom right of the slide, we found that the ganglion cell layers was the most critical retina feature for predicting contrast sensitivity. So these results together highlight a close linkage between the property of the retina structure and human visual function. And I would like to also uh, point out that currently we have no clear understanding of how people with low vision learn to recognize objects under deprived viewing condition, such as blur, low contrast, or reduced field of view. Although the, the visual feature of the object can be drastically different under such a viewing condition as demonstrated in this uh, slide. So to address these issues, we utilize a deep neural network to identify the critical feature used for um, object recognition under deprived viewing condition. 
So we are currently using this information to better understand the factor limiting everyday activities such as reading or object recognition in people with low vision. And there is also opportunity to, to optimize the remaining vision of people with low vision through the visual trainings. So I'd like to talk about one of the ongoing study in my lab addressing these issues. So when patients lose their central vision due to AMD, they adapt an eccentric location outside of scotoma as a pseudophobia for visual task or uh, guiding their eye movement. So this location in the periphery is called preferred retinal locus or PRL. And while stable PRL is uh, uh, often associated with better visual performance, the emergence of a stable PRL is a rather slow process, uh, taking at least six months to a year to fully develop. So to address these issues, our lab has developed a novel training protocol that may help facilitate development of PRL in patients with central vision loss by combining ocular motor training with perceptual learning uh, paradigm. So as a proof of concept, we first tested uh, the efficacy of the training in normally sighted subject. Basically, we wanted to see whether we can uh, make people use their peripheral vision to guide their eye movement or, and to recognize objects. So using a gaze contingent displays, we induce a simulated central scotoma in normally sighted subject. And in other words, subject central visual field was completely blocked by this gray patch, uh, while they, uh, their entire uh, peripheral visual field was significantly blurred, except for this small clear window presented in the peripheral vision. So this clear window was basically mimicking subjects prescribed PRL location. So training involved three visual tasks, word, face, object recognition, as they're highly relevant to real life activity. And during training, subject had to follow the target as quickly as possible as he moved to a new location across the, uh, the display screen while performing a highly demanding target recognition task. So we expected that subject would rely on this clear window presented in their peripheral vision for performing this task and guiding their eye movement instead of their central vision. So here are the results from A subjects. Uh, I'm showing the visual field in these circular maps where the center is a phobia and gray patch is scotoma. So color may represent each subject estimated PRL location and the orange dotted line showed that their training location. So as you can see, uh, the estimated PRLs of all subjects lie within their training location. So these results suggest that after eight to 10 hours of training, all subjects successfully learn to use their peripheral vision for performing visual tasks and guiding their eye movement. And the training also uh, significantly improved the precision of ocular motor control to the, to the level uh, that is comparable to the central vision condition. So where subject perform the same task without central uh, scotoma. So this uh, finding suggests that contrary to our conventional view, ocular motor control in peripheral vision can be as stable, as precise as in central vision with proper training regimen. Dr. Kwan, you're at the 18 minute mark. If you could wrap up in the next two minutes, yeah. please. Sure, thank you. So we also uh, found a significant improvement in object recognition and visual search performance fi uh, following the PRL training. So taken together, our results suggest that our training method may hold promise for a viable rehabilitation technique for patients with central vision loss. And so far I've shown you that our lab utilized various techniques such as psychophysics, eye tracking, retina imaging and computational modeling and machine learning and deep learning approaches to better understand the perceptual and functional issues in people with low vision. However, we believe that this may also help us bridge the existing gap between clinical assessment and patients' everyday visual functions, therefore, therefore uh, that improving the quality of life in low vision. I'd like to thank my amazing lab member and funding sources. Again, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to a Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Young, for this very, very exciting presentation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Gang Luo. 
Uh, after he received his engineering PhD in China, Dr. Luo went to Boston and received postdoctoral training uh, on low vision at the Harvard Medical School. He is uh, currently an associate professor at Harvard and associate scientist at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. His primary research interests include vision science, image processing, uh, vision assistance technology, uh, teleophthalmology, and uh, other uh, technologies related to low vision. In recent years, he has been studying how visually impaired people drive, walk, and use visual aids based on their behaviors in daily activities. It's my honor to uh, introduce you, Dr. Luo, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am glad uh, to join this webinar. I would like to thank RPB for giving me an uh, opportunity of speaking here. Uh, again, I would thank RPB for giving me a, a funding support to develop one of the apps I will be talking about today. So today I will uh, introduce a few apps uh, developed in my labs. And uh, when I, after introduce those apps, uh, we will talk about the, some of the study we have done uh, and try to understand uh, people's needs and people's behaviors. And so far, um, we have um, four apps already released to the public for free. And uh, we have uh, accumulated uh, um, more than 1 million downloads. Uh, the active users are more than 100. Uh, thousands. So the first app I will be talking about is called the Supervision Search. And I actually call it the Smart Magnifier. So it's essentially a magnifier. Um, but uh, um, it, it, the idea behind this app is we want to help people with visual search. Because, uh, you know, visual search is a big problem for people with low vision. And uh, I wanted to uh, uh, make notes here that uh, this app is made possible by support from RPB. So uh, this uh, try to explain the concept of why we need a view search. So for instance, you receive a views, and uh, uh, if you want to uh, find the website of this uh, company, you know every website uh, start with www, right? So if you type in the keywords or you, you can speak to this app, www, it will locate this area and zoom in, magnify that part, you will find the uh, website of this company. And this is another scenario. Uh, we try to search the crowd the shelf. Uh, this is a real case. Like uh, go to the uh, um, CVS pharmacy, you try to for, look for uh, erasers. Um, but you know, there's so many things there, uh, you couldn't find it and you take a picture uh, type in erasers and it will find, okay, zoom in, erasers right there to your left. And of course, you can speak to the app, not type in. Uh, so uh, we did the evaluation study comparing to optical magnifier. And we use the many kinds of items, daily items, including the restaurant menus, products, product uh, uh, catalog or phone books. And uh, um, this is what we found that for those easy view tasks, we don't see a benefit of uh, using this app versus to the conventional magnifier. And this is because you need a little bit of overhead time. Like you need to uh, take a picture, you, you speak to this app. So that takes some time. It's not like when you're using magnifier, uh, you can uh, immediately start to, to search. However, for some of the very, very difficult tasks, you need a lot of time to search, then you start to see the benefit. So uh, on the vertical axis, this is the search time. You can see that on the very left is the manual uh, search with the magnifier, and the next to it is search with this app. The search time is significantly reduced. So this is the, we show in the lab study the benefit of this app. So the second app uh, I want to introduce is called a Supervision Goggle. Uh, it is a low-cost uh, solution of a head-mounted view aids. 
and uh, it, uh, if you have a smartphone and you just need to order a low cost of VR goggle, virtual reality goggle from Amazon, which costs uh, maybe $20 or $30, and you put your phone in, you can immediately have this head mounted uh, video aids. <clears throat> So this app was uh, developed uh, because uh, I was motivated uh, when I see that some of the commercial available uh, head-mounted view aids are so expensive. Uh, they cost more than $1,000, even $10,000, like Eastside or Jersey. And so we developed this and we give it to some of the patient and they are very excited about uh, this uh, app. Uh, here I cite one of the users uh, uh, as comments. He said uh, uh, he's able to uh, using this app to watch TV. And another user sent us an email saying that this is so great that he can uh, teach her, his son how to do the soldering. And uh, just a quick uh, demonstration that uh, using this app uh, in this uh, low vision person, uh, his view acuity is a 2400. But right? when wearing this uh, goggle, uh, he was able to read the 2050 re uh, lines. So that's eight times improvement. So the third very app is a supervision magnifier. Uh, this is a very common, they, uh, you, you will see this uh, on the App Store or Play Store, many, many of this type of magnifier. And in our particular app, uh, we have uh, most of the common features, like uh, you zoom in, you can freeze the screen and take a snapshot, or you can turn on the flash, or you can uh, uh, change it to uh, inverted color mode. Uh, to enhance the, the, the images. So these are all, all commonly seen in many other apps. And uh, actually in our app, we have a very special feature. It's called a uh, live image stabilization. So when you uh, zoom in, uh, you, uh, typically you have a shake, image shaking. But in our app, if you press the screen and hold, the images will stabilize, as you can see here. And if you want to read uh, from left to right, uh, we have a mode that you can stabilize it vertically only, so allow you to move freely from left to the right to read. So these are the uh, uh, the apps I just talked about. Basically, they're all uh, magnif magnifier app, uh, uh, slightly different. So um, here I want to ask a question: How actually? Uh, those apps are used in people's daily life. So recently we did some studies and uh, we, this is uh, the first conclusion that we found that uh, those mobile uh, apps are used for mainly for spot reading. Yes, you, if, it is possible you can use it for a book reading, but mostly it is used uh, for spot reading. And this finding is based on our investigation on uh, 16,000 of the people over one month. And uh, here I want to share with you some of our findings. So th the first is this graph shows the length of the time uh, people use this app on each day. And, it, and on the vertical axis is the percentage of the users. As you can see, most of the users use this app uh, three minutes or later uh, or, or less. Very few people do use that for more than uh, 30 minutes per day. And if you look at how, how long they use the app, uh, each lunch, yeah, so when they open this app, uh, start this app and close it, this is called one lunch. And uh, you can see that most of the use lunches is uh, three minutes or, or less. But you still see a very small uh, amount of uh, 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 and the case is that uh, some people use it more than 30 minutes. So yeah, you, you can use that for, for reading books, but mostly they are use it for the app very shortly for spot reading. And we also look, look at the, the focusing distance of this app. And we found that uh, it's not like the uh, optical magnifier. It's only used for near vision reading. 
And when people have this app, you know, they have this uh, phone camera. These days, the phone camera is, uh, is very powerful. You actually can use that as a telescope. So we have the evidence to show that uh, there are some cases that the focusing distance is uh, two meters and even far away. So this is uh, showing that, okay, the, uh, the mobile magnifying app is uh, more uh, uh, versatile than optical magnifier. And here I want to share with you uh, some of the uh, examples for distance viewing uh, I happen to, uh, to come across. So this is a person using her iPad to watch the speaker in distance. And this is another person using the supervision uh, in, in a lecture. So the next question is that uh, what kind of view targets are people uh, are viewing when they use these apps? So this uh, recently uh, finished the study. And uh, <clears throat> we monitored uh, more than 24,000 users over one month. So we capture the images um, when they are using this app. So uh, we capture only one image when they have for each launch. So we don't capture many of them. Of them. Just one launch, we capture one images. And we send these um, images to a cloud uh, and uh, went through a artificial intelligence object recognition. And this is here are some example that here we can recognize uh, like a tables, a desk, a Lego, or outdoor scene, buildings, window, or text. So uh, oh, uh, uh, the, the users will not be able to see this, just, this is just for demo. Uh, and here is what we found. So here we, because we uh, are able to recognize more than thousands of uh, objects. So there's so many of them we need to, uh, um, uh, categorize them so that it's uh, it's possible we can interpret. So here we categorize to 11 uh, categories, text, indoor art, uh, human, etc. And uh, we compared the handheld magnifier and head-mounted goggles. As you can see that the blue is a magnifier. Most of the uh, target is text. So people use that for reading text. Okay, this is not a surprise, but the, please note that the proportion of the, the percentage of text is less than half percent, uh, less than a uh, half, uh, so less than 50%. So more than half of the target is actually non-textual. That's the majority. And this is even more if we look at the, um, uh, the goggle users. Uh, so indoor is the most, so more than half. So, and if you look at this uh, histogram, you will see that uh, the, the distribution of the handhold and uh, head mount is, is quite different. So this suggests that uh, there are different visual needs when, we, when users choose handhold or uh, uh, head mounted uh, video aids. And then the next question is uh, where those magnifier apps are used. So here we tracked their uh, the distance uh, between the two consecutive use. Let's say uh, you use it the first time, we uh, record the GPS location, and for the second, we record the GPS location and we calculate the distance between the two locations. And of course, we in this study, we didn't save the GPS. We only saved the, uh, the distance. As you can see, that uh, about 78% of the uh, distance uh, very small. So that means they're using this app in the same location. Uh, but you do see that uh, sometimes the distance can be very far, uh, very long, like a, even longer than a thousand uh, kilometers. And but the 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 interesting thing is that there seem to be a peak, even though it's a small, but it's a definitely a peak, uh, like a between five kilometers and fifty kilometers. So this distance is. Uh, consistent with people's average commute uh, distance, which is uh, about uh, 24 kilometers. So we we are wondering whether this is because people use this uh, in their workplace instead of home. 
So we tracked uh, uh, here and we did a study using the COVID-19 lockdown as an intervene. Uh, uh, because uh, during the lockdown, we know many people uh, stay at home. So we want to know if uh, we can see any pattern. Uh, so we tracked uh, uh, um, many users, uh, monthly users, it's more than 38 uh, thousands of them. We look at data back uh, retrospectively uh, from 2018 to 2020. And this is what we found. So on the vertical axis is the number of app launches. This is re represented their activity. So first of all, you will see there's a big drop in here. And this is around the April 2020. 2020. So this is the, the time that uh, the, uh, many countries started the uh, lockdown uh, around this time. And uh, we see this activity coming back. Uh, and here, this blue line uh, it indicates uh, like uh, many countries start to ease their lockdown restriction. So looks like the uh, COVID-19 lockdown does have an uh, impact. And interestingly, we also see a similar uh, activity drop uh, during the uh, holidays, like New Year's. And uh, you can see the, uh, the drop in uh, 2019 and also 2018. So, but uh, around the April time, you only see this in 2020, not 2019, because there's no lockdown in, in, in uh, 2019. So this suggests that uh, when people use this at home, seems that they need to use the app a little bit less. So if you look at the, we also look at the different region, like Japan, Europe, and the US, we see the same pattern. The interesting thing is if you look at the US, there are two major uh, holidays during the Christmas, New Year, and also Thanksgiving Day. And we see a drop. So this suggests that uh, um, people uh, seem to have a little bit less uh, demanding for the app uh, when they are at home. The reason we, we, we speculate that probably uh, they have a family members to uh, help with them, or they're very familiar with the home, uh, and they don't need to use the app a lot. Uh, um, on the other hand, it suggests that the app is used in workplace at uh, helping with the, their work. So those are the low vision apps, and I want to use this opportunity to introduce a, a new app we just recently developed for completely blind or severely impaired people uh, to help them access public transportation. And the pain point we try to address in uh, developing this app is that it's called the last 30 feet problems in navigation. So here just uh, illustrate uh, this person tried to uh, take a bus, but uh, she went to a wrong location and uh, missed the bus because the bus driver uh, didn't know, didn't realize this person is trying to catch a bus. And so we developed this. Hello, you're at the uh, 18, you're yeah. at the 18 minute mark. If you would please wrap up in the next two minutes. Yeah, yeah, just quick demo. Uh, so this is how the app works. This is the demonstration. As you can see, the GPS is not very accurate. Uh, even though the person is on the right side of the the street, uh, I mean, the, when the person is facing down, facing south. Uh, but the GPS, uh, sir, uh, Google Maps showing he's on the other side. And uh, so through this uh, screen recording, you will see that he's actually on, on the other side. And then when he used this app, can you hear the sound? So this beep indicate that uh, there's a bus uh, stop sign is uh, recognized. And also the beep is coded at the distance. This shows that, uh, indicates that uh, you're getting close to the bus uh, stop. So now this person arrived at the bus stop. If you go back to the Google map, uh, the Google map tells you you're still 50 away from the bus stop. Yeah, this is how it works. So currently this app works for uh, 
in nine metro cities and also in Germany, like Boston, Los Angeles, New York, DC, San Francisco, etc. Also in Germany. And we just did a very uh, preliminary uh, testing showing that uh, our uh, app much more accurate and more successful than Google Maps to locating uh, the bus stop. So my take home message is that we have some very nice uh, apps out there. Uh, please let uh, patients know about those free apps. They're completely free. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an exciting presentation. And uh, again, uh, Miyang and you are doing great work to help uh, patients navigate uh, the world with uh, limited or uh, decreased uh, vision function. We don't want to say visual acuity, right? And so uh, we would like to congratulate you and thank you for giving these very important insights. We have uh, 12 more minutes, uh, Brian. Uh, to uh, address some questions. This question is to both of you, and uh, it uh, comes uh, from uh, one of the people in the audience asking about uh, opportunities to volunteer. Uh, the specific question is for you, Mi Young, is research, uh, volunteering for research in eye exercises. Uh, can people volunteer for these? And then a similar question to you, Gang, would be, uh, as you are doing those studies, I know you're looking at population studies, can you have uh, like some volunteers who would be uh, helping you validate uh, the concepts you have developed, uh, like you did in the last presentation? We'll start with me, Young. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great question. And uh, so it depends on what kind of uh, the needs. And there's a, we have many different rehabilitative, uh, uh, the rest, the protocol. Uh, uh, so depending on your eye, the patient eye health condition, uh, it could be, it could be, if it's the central vision or peripheral vision, as I uh, briefly mentioned in my uh, talk. And so we use different uh, approach. So I think if you're interested in participating in our research, you, of course, we are always looking forward uh, you know, to love to have a uh, volunteer research participant. And, but however, we have to understand their uh, specific uh, eye health condition first to uh, address their main issue and how we actually, we can come up with a better approach. But, you know, I, I encourage everybody to feel free to contact me or my lab for uh, any future oppor uh, research opportunity. So when you research, uh, when you recruit patients to your studies, uh, uh, do you, target colleagues who send you patients or do you go reach to the public, to the local community first? Uh, how, we, what's the preference? We do both. And so right now, because I my lab is currently moved to uh, Northeastern University recently, right now I'm uh, uh, mostly rely on my uh, co uh, collaborator who was in, in Mass uh, Engineer in Boston. And he's basically helping us recruit a patient who depend uh, who are eligible for our study, but we are also hoping to reach out to uh, low vision other uh, the senior center and other pub, uh, other places for uh, um, to other you know research participants. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope this addresses the the question that was raised. Yang, would you like to add to that? Maybe the particulars uh, for your situation? Yes. Especially for people who are not in Boston now, uh, uh, there is center of gravity here, it seems, uh, yes. this session that is heavily weighted towards Boston. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, I would really appreciate uh, people who like to contribute this uh, by volunteering uh, in our study. Yes, that... Um, and so as I showed today that I showed the, uh, our lab testing, like the app seemed to be helpful, but also showed that in the real world, how much it helpful. So the lab study may not necessarily uh, represent the actual helpfulness you, you get in the real world. You know, uh, what if uh, people never need to search for very difficult stuff? Although I showed that you can help, but I don't have the needs. So that means this app may not actually in the real world, it's not useful in the real world. So we try to understand uh, uh, what is actually the real helpfulness in the real world. So we want to understand the, the, uh, 
uh, the daily use of the app and also we want to craft our lab study that can best uh, represent the real world. So in here, uh, we definitely need help from the, the volunteer, uh, even though you may not be in Boston. Uh, uh, if you uh, can, please check out our app. Uh, we anticipate that in the future, we're going to send some questionnaire or invitation, invite you to answer uh, our some of the simple questions uh, to help us to, uh, better understand uh, what kind of people are using this app and to tell us how helpful it is to your daily life. So those are very important the data for us to know. Uh, the, the, the study I showed today is only one way. We never get feedback from the users, so that's not complete. Uh, we definitely need uh, the feedback from users. If I may follow Dr. up. Lo, could you Go ahead, uh, Brian. Could you remind people where they can download the apps? I think that uh, there will be some interest and in people may not have, have uh, caught that the first time around. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I can provide the links for people to download. Uh, so uh, how, how did you reach uh, uh, so many users? Were you probably just uh, word of mouth or uh, because, uh, you know, people look for it or they search for apps and then they have some... Uh, organizations that would rank these apps because there, there are plenty of these apps all over and many maybe uh, let's say less useful than what you are providing because they're a quick side project for somebody rather than a focused uh, research program such as yours. Okay. Yeah, um, those are, uh, we don't know uh, uh, who those people are, but they are uh, our, uh, the, the user of our apps. So in our apps, we have uh, uh, those uh, runtime log uh, uh, collect, uh, data collection module in it. Uh, basically, we just monitor the activity. Uh, it's only one way. We never interact with the, the, the patient. I have, uh, I mean, if, if we, so we have another six minutes. So uh, uh, there are two questions that are coming from the audience. Uh, Khan Fan is asking uh, how have or how can these apps be applied to helping people with low vision navigate the COVID induced social distancing protocols? <laughs> and uh, another one from Linda Panuto. Thank you both for asking the questions. How to download the apps again? Uh, if um, you, you kind of attempted to answer this, but uh, and then I have another question for you, Mi Young, after Gang answers these two questions. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, we uh, the social distancing thing, uh, our app cannot do that. Uh, I will provide the link to, to people uh, if they are interested in. Uh, yeah. Okay. I have, I have a solution for, uh, for the social distancing. My car always has social distancing. As I come next to another car, it starts beeping. So uh, we need an app like that, that you put it in your phone and if it detects another phone nearby, it tells you you are less than six feet away. Mm. Uh, but I don't think there are, maybe there are people who developed this. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we first need to understand the needs and uh, you know, people have uh, many different ideas. So, and uh, Hopefully, RPB can keep uh, continue supporting us to develop those apps. Uh, definitely, we would like to do. Mm -hmm. Young, I have a question about uh, the crowding phenomenon that you so mm -hmm. eloquently described and, and you attributed uh, the difficulties for uh, patients to be, despite good central vision, in, especially in glaucoma, I think is the example that you gave. Could you elaborate uh, about your your understanding of what else is going on in in this uh, condition? Is it uh, the ganglion cell pathology is greater in these uh, in the macula than we anticipate? But of course, we're paying attention to where the visual field loss is actually most uh, uh, most happening. And so, there is loss of ganglion cells there, or is this what some people call the disease? ganglion cell uh, pathogenesis, meaning there is therefore hope if it's diseased and not dead in the macula of 
having some treatments that can reverse the vision and potentially improve that component, even though the, vi the visual field is not affected. Yeah, so I think uh, there's a couple of issues here. Um, so the acuity, visual acuity, or the visual field map, like a parametry, the common, uh, the, the, the functional test for uh, the glaucoma, this, uh, glaucoma patient are not quite sensitive enough to uh, uh, the capture the, the macular damage already present in the, the central visual field. So those are actually uh, the picked up by the, the imaging technique, which is like OCP. And so, and that's actually motivate me to look into this. What is the functional, uh, the consequences of the, those macular damage? So, uh, so I think that's kind of um, so this current uh, the the functional test testing tool might not be like allow us to uh, see this all the details uh, the deficit already present in the macular disease, and so current treatment for uh, glaucoma is could. Uh, in the managing the progress of the, the disease. However, there's no, we don't, uh, to my knowledge, there's no such a treatment or uh, the medication to reverse the, uh, the visual condition. So the uh, best thing is we need to, you know, I would encourage everybody to have comprehensive eye exam uh, regularly. And so try to figure, to see this uh, sick, the, uh, the professional, like the eye health uh, help before actually the, you know, the disease is progress into the later stage. And so that's the- I, I was thinking maybe potentially if you wanna have a trial of glaucoma patients and then uh, the pressure is lowered drastically under strict controls. And then maybe you find out that there is, if it's diseased ganglion cells in the area, you may find, uh, even though the visual field is not changed, some improvement in visual function. Right, right. Uh, proposal for RPB, I think. Uh, right, Brian? Uh, we'll give you the last word, Brian, and thank you so much, me <laughs> and gang. So we're at the end of our hour. Um, I just would ask everybody to stay on. There's actually one more question that maybe as we close out the session, we can still answer that, that question to Dr. Um, Kwan. But I, I want to thank our two speakers. That uh, is very fascinating presentations and um, really uh, providing a bridge between vision science and uh, clinical aspects. And low vision is such a oftentimes neglected area within ophthalmology. So we thank you for your presentations. And Dr. Azar, thank you very much for your able moderation. We're very fortunate we have to have one some of your stature or one involved in this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Brian, uh, quick question from Michael Eyal. Uh, this is for me, Young. You mentioned eight hours training was sufficient. Are you referring to eight hours of computer time? Because that would depend on the hardware being used. Thanks. So it's a comment, maybe, and a question. But if you have a yes, no, quick answer, that would be great. Uh, and then we would like to end on time. Yeah, Thanks. so eight hours of our uh, the, like the, the, the training on our computer, right? So uh, is that addressed? Yes, yes. In <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank everybody who participated by joining us today in today's session. And we really appreciate also our funding partners and also all of you who are our friends and supporters of RPB. Thank you very much. And this brings us to an end of our session. Thank you all.